Simon says subscribe and click on the bell icon to receive notifications. We've made the files the instructor uses in this tutorial available for free. Just click the link below in the video details to get these. Hello and welcome to the Object-Oriented Programming course in Python. I'm Majid and I've been a software developer for more than 15 years. And during this time, I have worked with various programming languages including C++, Java, PHP and of course Python. In this course, I will be your host and I hope to be able to share my experience and knowledge about object-oriented programming in Python with you. Object-oriented programming or OOP for short is a computer programming model that as you can guess from its name it breaks the program on the basis of the objects in it. An object can be defined as a set of attributes and methods. If you find this definition hard to grasp, don't worry. Later, we will see lots of examples that definitely help you to understand the concept. Object-oriented programming has lots of advantages. Because OOP breaks your program into individual objects, it is well suited for programs that are large, complex, or are actively updated or maintained. The organization of an object-oriented program makes this approach beneficial for collaborative development, where projects are divided into groups because each developer can focus on an object and finally their codes are put together to build a larger program. The next benefit of OOP is reusability. You can create once and you can use your code multiple times in different projects. Given the many benefits of object-oriented programming, many of job postings require you to be an expert in using this approach. So if you want to be an expert programmer and get a good job, it's essential to learn object-oriented programming. And if you're looking for a comprehensive and highly practical course that takes you from zero to hero in object-oriented programming, this course is definitely what you're looking for. In this course, we will begin with the basic concepts in object-oriented programming paradigms such as class, objects, attributes, and methods. We will then move on to advanced topics in object-oriented programming including inheritance and encapsulation. And finally, I will show you how to make your classes more user-friendly and powerful using something called magic methods. In this course, we will be starting from very beginning and there really isn't too much I expect you to know about OP before starting this course. However, you do need to have some of experience with coding in Python. If you don't know anything about Python programming language, this course is not for you. You will definitely need to take a course on Python first and then come back and take this course. During this course, we will implement several different examples of classes and I hope these examples help you to better analyze any given problem statement and develop a mental model of objects necessary to create software. So, by the end of this course, you will be able to develop understanding of writing object-oriented programs that combine functions and data. I don't want to waste the time because I'm really excited to start the course and I'm sure you are too. So, let's get started. Hi, in the first chapter of this course, I will talk about basic concepts in object-oriented programming, which is usually called OOP. Object-oriented programming is a programming paradigm that is based on the concept of objects. In fact, objects are the basic units of object-oriented programming. So, you might ask what the object is. Objects are everything in the real world that you can imagine, such as a car, house, students, or anything like this. If it is still confusing, let me show you some examples. Suppose you are going to create a university management system. In such a system, you can see lots of concepts, including students, professors, courses, classrooms, employees, textbooks, and exams. Each of these can be considered as an object. And each object has two parts, attributes and behavior. In this system, Think about student as an object. What are the attributes for one student? Each student has name, student number or ID, age, the courses that he or she has passed and many other attributes. How about behavior? A student can at least take a course or withdraw from the course. So student has two behavior or two methods. As another example, suppose you are thinking of designing a game like the River Raid Atari game. On the screen, you can see lots of things. The airplane, the enemies such as helicopters or a ship, 
and the fuel station. All of these can be considered as objects that have attributes and methods. Here, for example, if you think of airplane, you find that it has some attributes such as location, shape, fuel, or a score. Also, the airplane has some behavior. At least it can move right, it can move left, it can shoot the enemies, and it can refuel. As a more abstract example, suppose that you want to develop an application like Paint in Windows. In this application, shapes including circles, rectangles, polygons, and triangles can be considered as an object. And each of them has attributes and behaviors. For example, consider a circle as an object in your mind. What attributes and methods you can think of for a circle? A circle has a radius, color, location on canvas, and thickness. And also it can have some methods or behavior. For example, you can move a circle to right or left or up or down. You can change its color. You can delete it from the canvas and so on. And these are behaviors or methods for a circle. I hope these examples have made it clear to you about the basic concepts in object-oriented programming and give you an idea about how to think of everything as object. You should be able to find attributes and behavior for any objects. But if you still feel difficulty in understanding object-oriented programming, don't worry. Object-oriented programming is a broad concept and it's not quite possible to grasp all at once. In fact, mastering OOP can take several months. It totally depends upon your practice. In this chapter, we will take an in-depth look at the concept of object-oriented programming in Python, and I hope it will be helpful for you. In the next video, we will start coding and implementing the first object in Python. In the previous video, I talked about the concept of object in OOP paradigm, and I showed you that you can think of anything as an object. So now, that you know a little more about what an object is, without wasting more time, let's define our first object in Python. Suppose that you want to develop a bank account system. In this system, there are many objects such as customers, bank accounts, credit cards, checks, and mortgages. Here, let's focus on bank account as an object. What attribute bank account has? At least, you can think of its number, holder's name, and balance. So the bank account has three attributes. It has more attributes in the real world application, but here it's just an example. So let's jump into code and see how to create a bank account object in Python. Before creating the bank account object, first I want to show you that you are already familiar with the concept of objects, methods, and attributes in Python, and you have used them before. At this point, you may think OOP is entirely a new concept to you and you don't know anything about it, but actually it's not true. First, let me create a new Python file named main.py. I'm using VS Code and in VS Code, to create a new file, you just need to click on Explorer in the left sidebar and then click on New File icon to create a new file. And here, let's create a list with some data. When you create a list like this, you in fact create an object of type list. A list has some data and some methods. You can access data using indexing operator and you can call its methods using dot notation. For example, to call append method, I can say l.append and then I pass a new value as argument. As you see, you know how to create a list object and how to work with its methods. Similar to lists, dictionaries, strings and sets are objects that you can work with them. But the question is how we can create our own data type or objects. So let's get back to the bank account problem. In Python, when you want to create a user-defined object like bank account in our example, we have to define a template for it. In programming terminology, this template is called a class. So when you think of an object, you first need to create a class for that object. It's a good habit to define your classes in separate files. So first, I create a new Python file named bankaccount.py and then I define the bank account class in this file. So again, I click on new file icon and here I create bankaccount.py. In Python, you can create a class using the class keyword. Here, I want to create a class for bank account objects. So I type class and then I specify a name for my class, which is bank account. In Python, the name of classes starts with capital letter by convention, and I strongly recommend you to follow this convention. After the name of class, just like defining a function, you need a colon, 
and in the following line we will write the body of the class. Again just like function every class in Python should have a body and if you don't define a body for the class it will cause a syntax error. So here let me type pass which for Python means the class doesn't do anything. This is the simplest definition for a class in Python. Just after this simple one-line definition, you can use this class to create an object. To do this, first let's go back to the main.py and I remove these two lines. And to be able to use the bank account class, which is defined in bank account.py, I have to import it. So here I type from bank account with lower b, which is the name of the file import bank account with capital B which is the name of the class and now I can create a new object from this class to do so I say acc1 equals bank account and that's it we created our first user defined object in Python now let's print the type for acc1 and run our code to run the code go to the run menu and click on run without debugging here, as you see in the terminal, it says that ACC1 is a bank account. Although you created your first object, it's a useless object. In fact, it doesn't do anything because we didn't write the body for our class. So let's get back to the class definition and complete our template for bank account object. When you create an object from a class, a special function named underscore underscore init underscore underscore is called under the hood. This function is usually called constructor because it is responsible for constructing a new object. We should define this function and specify what we want to happen when an object is created. Here inside the class body instead of pass I have to define this function. So I type def underscore underscore init underscore underscore and inside this function I print a message a new bank account was created. Before I continue let me explain a bit more about this function. When we define a function inside a class like this function it is called a method instead of a function so method is nothing but a function that is defined inside a class second underscore underscore init underscore underscore is a special method its name starts and end with double underscore we usually name this method dunder init dunder and dunder is short for double underscore we have many special methods whose name starts and ends with dunder. We can talk about them in the last chapter of this course. The last point in defining a method is that the method of the class usually takes a parameter called self that represent the instance of the class. It means that self point to the object and we can access the attributes and methods through this parameter. If it's not clear or hard to understand, don't worry. For now, just accept it that the first parameter for methods is self. So here I add self as the first parameter. Okay, now let's go back to the main.py file and run this code. As you can see in the terminal, you can see the message a new bank account was created. This is printed because by creating an object, the init method of the class runs. As we discussed earlier, a bank account has three attributes. So let's complete the definition for bank account. Here inside the init method, I want to say the bank account has an attribute called number. As I told you inside the class, we can access the bank account object by using self. So here I say self that number equals one, two, three. Similarly, I define holder and balance for this object. Now let's go back to the main.py. Here after creating ACC1 from bank account class, I can access its attribute. Here I say print acc1 and to access number I use dot notation. Similarly I can print acc1.holder and acc1.balance. Now let's see the output. As you can see we can access all attributes for our object. Now let's define another bank account. To do so I say acc2 equals bank account. And now let's copy this code to print attribute for this new bank account. And instead of ACC1, I have to say ACC2. Now let's see the result. As you see, both accounts have the exact attributes. It's because in the init method inside the class, the holder attribute is always set to Alex. But in practice, this is not what we want. We want to create different bank account. When I create a bank account here, I would like to say holder equals name, the number is one to three 
and the balance is ten dollar similarly I would like to set the attribute for the second bank account by passing these argument to the class in fact I'm passing some argument to the class constructor so let's go back to the bank account .py, and here for the init method I have to set three parameters holder number and balance and inside the method instead of setting attributes to fix values I set self the number to the number which comes as input argument and let me do the same thing for other parameters now let's go back to the main.py and run this code as you see this time we have two different bank accounts object and each of them has its own attributes the number for the first bank account is 123 and the number for the second one is 567 the holder of the first bank account is Alex and the holder for the second bank account is Bob the balance for the first bank account is $10 and the balance for the second bank account is $100 in this video you learned how to create simple class how to define constructor method how to define objects from the class and finally how to access the objects attribute inside and outside of the class now you can do the exercise one for this chapter in the next video you will see how to add methods to your class Simon says subscribe and click on the bell icon to receive notifications. As we discussed earlier, objects are defined by their attributes and methods. In the first video of chapter 1, you learned how to create your own class and add some attributes to the class. Consider the bank account object we created in the last video. We saw that the bank account has three attributes, account number, holder's name, and balance. Now let's see what methods a bank account object has. Just think about what we can do with our bank account. We can deposit money into the bank account and we can withdraw money from a bank account. So these are two behavior of a bank account object. In this video, we will see how to add methods to our class. Now let's go to the code and see what we can do in practice. This is the bank account class we created in the last session. This class has three attributes, but it just has one method. The only method in this class is Dunder init Dunder method, which is invoked implicitly when we create a new bank account object from this class. Now, let's see how we can add deposit and withdraw methods to this class. As we talked before, methods are functions that are defined inside the class. So, inside the class, I define two functions. The first one is named deposit and the second one is named withdraw and as I told you in the previous video we have to pass self as the first parameter to the methods so I add self to the both methods when defining methods I usually recommend my students to use a top-down approach in the top-down approach you imagine that the class definition is completed now how would you like to use the object how would you like to call its methods here let's go to the main.py and here after creating ACC1 from the bank account how would you like to deposit money to ACC1 I would prefer to say ACC1.deposit $20 and it means I want to add $20 to ACC1 it means that deposit method needs an input argument so now I go to deposit method in bank account.py here and I add another parameter called amount and inside the method I have to update the balance with the amount of money so I say self.balance plus equal amount note that inside the method I can access balance through the self parameter in other words you cannot say balance plus equal amount because balance is not defined inside the method so let me remove this line okay now let's complete the withdraw method Again, in top-down approach, we imagine that the class is ready. Let's go to the main.py. How would you like to call the withdraw method? I would prefer to say acc1.withdraw $10. It means that withdraw method needs another parameter. So let's go to the bank account.py. Here in withdraw method, I add another parameter called amount. The implementation of this method is a bit more complicated. We cannot withdraw any amount of money from the bank account. It should be equal or lower than the balance so inside the method 
first I say if amount is equal or lower than self dot balance then self dot balance decreased by the amount otherwise a message will be printed not enough money before we run our code let me slightly modify the init method here I want to define a default value for the balance which is zero because when we create a new bank account it makes sense that it has no money in it or the balance is zero now let's go to the main.py and make some modification to this file first of all I delete the balance for the account one I can delete it because the balance has a default value inside the init method. Also, let me comment ACC2 and just focus on ACC1. And before and after each of these transactions, I would like to print the balance to make sure that these transactions are done correctly. So let me copy from here and paste it here, also here and here. And oh. I made a mistake in typing withdraw and let me correct it also let me withdraw some more money here I say acc one that withdraw $15 and then I print the balance for acc one and now we can run our code okay as you see after creating the bank account object the balance is zero and then we deposit $20 so the balance is $20 and after that we withdraw ten dollar from the account so the balance would be ten dollar and in the next step when we want to withdraw fifteen dollar from the account because it's more than the balance this transaction cannot be done so the message not enough money is printed on the screen and the balance will remain ten dollar well done in this video you learned how to add methods to your class now please go to the assignment section and do the assignment for this video so far you have learned the concept of class object methods and attributes in the last two videos we defined a class for bank account and in this video i'm going to introduce a new special method called dunder cr dunder which is responsible for printing objects so stay tuned and let's jump into code to learn more about this method this is the code that we completed in the previous lesson let me directly jump into the problem with this code and then I will show you how to solve this problem. In the main.py file, first let me comment all the lines except the line for creating ACC1. In VS Code, there is a shortcut for commanding multiple lines. You need to select the lines and then hit Ctrl slash. Now, like other data types like strings, lists or dictionaries, I would like to print this bank account object. To do so, I say print acc1. Note that instead of printing attributes such as acc1.number or acc1.holder, this time I would like to print acc1 as a whole. Now let's run the code and see the output. As you see, it prints a strange message that only tells us the object is a bank account, but it doesn't give us more information about this object, such as its number, its holder, or its balance. If you remember when we creating an object from the class, the init method was called behind the scenes. In fact, the init method is not called directly. Instead, it is invoked implicitly by Python. The story for printing an object is very similar. When you print an object, a special method called dunderSTRDunder is called under the hood. This method returns a string description of an object. So if you want to print more informative description about the object, you have to define Dunder SCR Dunder method in your class. So let's go to the bank account class description in the bank account.py here and define Dunder SCR Dunder method. So here I type def Dunder SCR Dunder and then I pass self as the first parameter like other methods. And inside this method, I have to return a string object. This string is better to include the class name, which is the bank account here, and then the attributes or at least a list of most important attributes of the object. Here, because we have just three attributes, I list all of them, self.number, self.holder, and self.balance. Now, let's go to the main.py file and then run this code. As you see this time, instead of a previous strange message, a very descriptive message is shown. In this video, you learned what Dunder SCR Dunder method is and how you can work with it. 
This is the second special method that you have learned in this video and during this course you will learn many others as well. There is assignment for this video in the assignment section and I suggest you to do it to make sure that you have learned how to use Dunder SCR Dunder method. Hello and welcome to the last video of chapter 1. In the previous lessons of this chapter, you learned the basic concepts of object-oriented programming in Python. Now you are able to define your own classes that have attributes and methods. Although objects are defined as an individual concept, they usually work together. Sometimes you need to use an object inside another object. Let me give you an example. Suppose that you want to create a shopping list application. In this application, the shopping list might be an object. But what are the attributes and methods for a shopping list? In practice, the attributes and methods you consider for an object depend entirely on the definition of the problem and the needs of the end users. In this example, suppose that the shopping list has a title and a set of products. And what about methods? At least we should be able to add a product to shopping list. Also, we want to see the products in a shopping list. But what is the product here? We can consider the product as another object. What attributes does a product have? A product has a title and quantity. And what about methods? We can change the quantity for a product, so it has just one method. As you see in this example, we have a shopping list object in which there is another object named product. This video will show you how to define objects that use other objects. So let's jump into the code. Before everything, let me create a new Python file named shoppinglist.py that is going to contain definition for product and shopping list class. To do so, I just click on the explorer on the left sidebar menu and then I click on new file icon and here I type shoppinglist.py and here in this file we have to define our classes. When dealing with some related objects, we usually start with the smallest one. So let's start with creating a class for product. Here I say class, following by the name of the class, which is product, and colon. Inside the class, the first method I should define is dunder in it dunder method, which is the constructor for the class. So I say def dunder in it dunder, and I pass self as the first parameter. Because each product object has a title and quantity, I take these two values as input argument in the init method. So I add title and quantity as parameters. Inside the init method, I set self.title to title and self.quantity to quantity. Okay, that's it. The definition of our init method is complete. Now let's define str method to be able to print the product. To do so, I say def dunder str dunder and I pass self as first parameter and inside the method I have to return a string that describes the object. This string tells us that the object is product and it shows title and quantity for the product. So here I type product and self the title and self that quantity. As we discussed earlier, we have to be able to change the quantity for the product. So I define another method named change quantity, which takes self and a new quantity for the product. And inside the method, we have to assign new quantity to the self.quantity. Well done. The definition for the product class is complete. So let's go ahead and define a class for shopping list. Here I say class shopping list with capital S because it's a convention. And inside the class first, let's define the init method. The init method takes self and title as parameter and sets self.title to title. The shopping list has another attribute named items, which is a list that contains a list of shopping items. When we create a shopping list, this list is empty, so I initialize it with an empty list. Okay, the init method is done, and it's time to define str method for this class. To do so, I enter def dunder str dunder, and I pass self to it and it should return a string. For shopping list object, I would like to print its type, its title, and the number of items in the shopping list. So I say shopping list, self.title, and the length of the items. Okay, now let's define other methods for this class. We need to define two methods. One is add, which is used for adding an item to the shopping list, 
and the other one is show for showing the items in the shopping list. Now let's complete each of these methods. The add method takes self and a new item that we want to add to the shopping list as parameters. So here I add a new parameter named new item. And inside the method I have to add new item to the self.items. And because self.items is a list, I can use append method to add new item to self.items. So here I say self.items.append new item. This single line is enough for the add method, but just as validation check, let's check if the new item is valid input or not. The new item should be an instance of product class. So I can use is instance function. To do so, I say if is instance new item and product, then append the new item to the list. Otherwise, we can print a message that shows the new item is not valid. So here I say else print new item is not a product. Also, let me print a message here that shows the adding is successful. Here I say print the new item was added to the list. The definition of add is complete. Now let's continue with the show method. The show method should only print all products in the shopping list. So it doesn't need any additional input parameter. Here inside the method, first I print the number of shopping items in the shopping list. And now I use a for loop over self.items to print each of items. So here I say for item in self.items, print item.title and item.quantity. Perfect. The definition for both classes is complete. Now let's create another file named main.py and use these two classes. In the left sidebar menu, here click on the new file icon and type main.py. In this file, to be able to use the classes we have defined, first we have to import them. To do so, I say from shopping list with lower s, which is the name of the file, import shopping list with capital S and product with capital P. Now let's create a new shopping list. To do so, I say list1 equals shopping list. And as you see, we need to pass a title to the shopping list constructor. Here I say, for example, grocery. Now let's print the shopping list and also call the show method for this shopping list to see if it works correctly or not. So here I say print list1 and then I call the show method for list1. And now let's run the code and see the output. As you see, our shopping list is printed correctly and it says there is no product in it. Okay, now let's add some products to our shopping list. First, we have to create some products. For example, product one equals product. And now, as you see, I have to pass title and quantity. For example, tomato and two. And the other one, product two, is one milk. And the third one is two bread. Now we can add these products to the shopping list using add method. To do so, I say list1.add and then I pass product1. And similarly for product2 and product3. Also, let me add, for example, a string to the list to see what happens. For example, I say list.add and then instead of passing a product, I pass a string, for example, banana. Now, let me print the list and also I want to see all the products in the list, so I call show method for the list. Okay, now let's run the code and see the result. As you see, everything works well. The first three products are added to the list, but the last one was not a product, so it's not added to the list. Also, as you see, the show method works well, and it prints the product correctly. In this video, which was the last video of chapter 1, you learned how to create a class that uses another class in it. I hope this video helped you better understand object-oriented programming. However, don't forget that mastering this subject requires a lot of practice. Now, please go to the assignment section and solve the assignment related to this video. One of the powerful features in object-oriented programming is inheritance. And in this chapter, we will talk about this in detail. Inheritance is the procedure in which one class inherits the attributes and methods of another class. 
The class whose attributes and methods are inherited is known as parent class or super class and the class that inherits the attributes from the parent class is the child or subclass. The interesting thing is that along with the inherited attributes and methods, a child class can have its own attributes and methods. In this video, I will talk about class inheritance and to better explain the concept of inheritance, I decided to define a new problem. Suppose you want to design and implement a software like Paint in Windows. If you take a look at the menu in Paint, you see several different shapes in Shapes group, such as a square, rectangle, circle, and many others. In implementation of such application, you can consider each of these shapes as an independent object. But the reality is different. Although these shapes are different, they have some shared attributes. They have a location on canvas, they have a filling color, border color, border thickness, and so on. So instead of considering each of them as an isolated object, it's better to have a parent class with some basic and shared attributes and methods, and some child class which inherits from the parent class. By the end of this video, you will be able to create a new class that inherits from an existing class. Now let's jump into code and see inheritance in Python. Before everything, let me create a file named shape.py in which we will define our classes. So I click on Explorer and then on new file icon and here I enter the name of the file. Also, let me create another file named main.py in which we will import our classes and use them. Well done. Now let's start by defining our classes in shape.py. As we discussed earlier, I want to define different classes for different shapes. But we saw that different shapes have some shared attributes and methods and it's better to have a parent class that shares the attributes and methods that are common among different shapes. Usually it's better to begin with defining the parent class. So first let's create the shape class. To do so I say class shape with capital S to follow the convention and now I define the dunder init dunder method and I pass the self as the first parameter. For now, here assume that a shape object has three attributes, border color, border thickness, and location on the canvas. So I pass these three attributes to the init method. And now I have to assign these parameters to the self. Here I say self.borderColor equals border color, self.border thickness equals border thickness, and self.location equals location. Okay, now let's define the dunderstr dunder method for the shape class. For this, I say def dunderstr dunder and then I pass self as the parameter. And inside, I have to return a string object. This string includes the name of the class, which is shape, and the values for attributes. So I add self.borderColor, self.borderThickness, and self.location. Also, suppose that we would like to be able to change the border color. So I define a method named change border color, which takes self and a color as parameters. And inside this method, I set the self.border color to color. You can also define another method for changing the border thickness as an exercise. At this point, our shape class is ready. And now let's go ahead with creating a new class for representing circles. So just like before, I define a new class named circle with capital C. And here is the difference. Because I know that a circle is a kind of shape and it shares the shape attributes, I enter a pair of parentheses here. And inside the parentheses, I enter the name of the parent class, which is the shape. And this means that circle class inherits everything from the shape class. The shape class here is called parent class or super class or base class. On the other hand, the circle class, which inherits everything from the shape class, is called child class, subclass, or derived class. For now, I just enter pass in the body of the circle class and leave it without any code. Just with this single line of code, our circle class is ready to use. Although we haven't defined any method for this class, because it inherits from the shape class, it has a copy of the methods and attributes of the shape class. Now let's go to the main file and create a circle object. Before creating a circle object, first we have to import the circle class from shape.py. 
So I say from shape with lower S, which is the name of the file, import circle with capital C, which is the name of the class. And now we are able to use the circle class. Here I define C1 as an object from circle class. And as you see in the parameter hint window, I have to pass three attributes, border color, border thickness, and location. Here I pass blue for border color, three for border thickness, and finally a tuple of two and three, which is the location in 2D canvas coordination. Note that here, because we didn't define the init method for our circle class, when we create a circle object, the init method of the shape class is called. And this is why we have to pass these three attributes for creating a circle. Now I would like to print C1 to see everything is okay. Again, note that although the donder star donder method is not defined for the circle class, because it has been defined for its parent, we can print a circle object. Also, we can access change border color for C1. If I type C1 following by a period, you can see this method in the list of suggestions. Here, for example, let's change the color to black. And now let's print it again and run the code to see the output. As you see in the terminal, our circle object works without any errors. At first, the circle is blue and after changing the color, it is black. The only problem with the output is that it says the object is shape, not a circle. And if you take a look again at the str method of the shape class in shape.py, you see this is because here we explicitly said that this is a shape. To fix this issue, I replace shape with a more general statement. To get the name of the class for the self object, I can say self.dunder class dunder dot dunder name dunder. And this returns the name of the class for the self object. And if I go back to the main.py, and run the code, you will see that this time it says it's a circle, not a shape. To this point, the circle class is nothing but a copy of the shape class. It has no attributes or methods of its own. But as you know, in the real world, a circle has a fundamental attribute, which is its radius. So we have to define radius as an attribute for our circle class. To define a new attribute, first we have to define the init method for the circle class. So let's go to the shape.py and here inside the body of the circle class, I define the init method and I set self as the first parameter. Here I rewrite the init method for the child class. When we rewrite a method for the child class, we say we overwrite that method. In fact, method overriding in object-oriented programming is a feature that allows the child class to provide a specific implementation of a method that is already provided by its parent class. When we overwrite a method for the child class, the parent method is no longer applicable. To see what happens under the hood and make it clear for you, let me just pass here inside the init method and go to the main.py and rerun our code and see what happens. As you see, we got an error. The error says the init method takes one positional argument, but four were given. But what is the reason behind this error? The reason behind this error is that this time we have the init method for our circle class. If I go to the shape.py here, you can see that init method for the circle class just has one parameter. But here in the main file, we are passing three arguments to the init method and including self, we are passing four arguments. And this is why the Python says the init method takes one argument, but four were given. This shows us that after overriding the init method, the init method of the parent class is no longer applicable. So now let's go ahead and complete the init method for the circle class. Here I have to pass the parameters I need to create a circle. I need radius, border color, border thickness, and location. And now I have to assign these parameters to the self. Here I say self.borderColor equals border color, self.border thickness equals border thickness, and self.location equals location, and self.radius equals radius. If you take a look at the init method of the parent class, here you can see that these three lines are repetitive. We have the same lines here inside the init method of the shape class. So instead of these three lines, I call the init method of the shape class. So I replace these three lines with this statement. Super open and close parentheses dot dunder init dunder and open and close parentheses. 
In this statement, super points to the super class, which is the shape class. And now I have to pass required arguments to the init method. The init method of the shape class requires border color, border thickness, and location. So I pass border color, border thickness, and location to the init method of the shape class. At this point, our circle class has its own init method. Let's go to the main.py and rerun our code and see what happens. As you see, I got another error and this is because when we are creating a circle, we have to pass a radius as the first argument. So here I pass 10 as radius. And now let's run the code again. As you see, this time we didn't get any error, but the problem is that when printing a circle, we can't see the radius for a circle because the circle object doesn't have its str method. So let's go to the shape.py here and define our str method for the circle object. Here I say def dunder str dunder and I pass self as the first parameter and again inside the str method I have to return a string object. The story for defining the str method is very similar to the story of defining dunder init dunder method. Here again instead of writing repetitive codes I call the str method of the super class. Here I say super dot dunder str dunder and I also add radius to this string. And now let's go to the main.py and rerun our code. Well done. As you see here the radius is printed for the circle object. Now let's go to the shape.py and define another method to calculate the area of the circle. To do so, I define a method named area with self as the first parameter. And inside this method, it should compute and return the area of the circle. Because I need the value of pi, let me first import the mass library. So here at the beginning of the file, I import mass. And now I return mass.py times self.radius to the power of 2. Okay, now let's go to the main.py and here print c1.area. And if I run the code, you can see that the area for the circle is printed here. In this video, you learned what inheritance means and how to create a child class that inherits from parent class. Now please go to the assignment section and do the assignment for this video. In the last video you learned how to create a class that inherits attributes and methods from another class. But sometimes the child class inherits from multiple parent classes. For example, suppose we have three classes A, B and C and C inherits from A and B. Suppose that both parents have a method with similar name. The most common case is the init method. In this picture, both parents have a method named dunder init dunder. In this situation, the first question is which of these two methods will run when a child calls the init method? This is a concept called MRO or method resolution order, which I'm gonna talk about in this video. In this video, first, I show you how to create such a class that has multiple parent classes and then we will see what happens when child class calls the method that is inherited from multiple parent classes. So let's start and jump into code. Let's start by creating a class named A and I only define the init method for this class. This method takes self as the only parameter and it prints a message like this inside of A. Okay, the definition of the A class is done. Now let me define another class named B that inherits from A and inside this class I just say pass. Well done. Now let's create A1 as an object of type A and run the code to see the result. What happened here? When we create A1, the Python says a new object of type A is being created. So I have to look for the init method of the A class. And because we have defined the init method for the A class, it will be executed and you see the message inside of A in the output. Now let me change it to B. This time I create an object named B1 of type B. And now let's run the code. 
Again, you can see that inside of A is printed in the terminal. In the execution time, the Python says a new object is being created from class B. So I have to run the init method of the class B. If it finds the init method, then it executes the method. But what will happen when it doesn't find the init method? Should it return an error? No. In this case, Python looks for the init method of the parent class. In our case, the parent class is A. So it executes the init method of A class. This is why it prints inside of A when we're creating an object of type B. Now let me show you something surprising. Here I define a class named C and it doesn't derive from any other class. And inside the body of the class, I just say pass. And now let's create an object of type C. Here I say C1 is an object of type C. Now what will happen if I run the code? At the time of creation of C1, Python looks for the init method of the class C. And it can't find such a method. So it looks for any parent class but there is no any parent class for class C. So it seems that Python should return an error. Now let's run the code and see the result. As you see, Python execute the code without an error. But what happened here? The reason is that all classes in Python inherit from a special empty class called object. In other words, when you define a class, for example, the C class here, it's actually like this. It inherits from object class and the object class is an empty class that has an empty init method. So when we create an object of type C, Python runs the empty init method of the object class. This is the reason that Python does not return any error in our program. To make sure here I can print the parent class for the C class by saying C, the capital C, which is the name of the class, dot dunder base dunder. This returns the base or parent class for the C class. And if I run the code, you will see that in terminal, it prints object as the base class for the C class. Now let's move on to the more advanced topic, which is inheriting from multiple classes. Here, I want to define four classes, but before that, let me delete all these lines. The first one is class A. And the init method of class A takes self as the parameter and it prints the message inside class A. And now let me make three copies of class A. The second class is B and it inherits from class A and I change the message here to inside class B. The third one is C and again this inherits from the A class and also let me change the message to inside class C. And the last one is class D, which inherits from two classes. It inherits from B and C, and it does not have any init method. So I enter pass inside this class. The important and new concept in this example is that D has two parents. Now let's create D1 as an object from the D class. What do you expect to see in the terminal if I run this code? As you see, D does not have its own init method. When creating object, Python goes to the parent classes. It goes over the parent classes one by one from left to right. Here, the first parent class is B. So the Python executes the init method of B. Now let's run the code and see the output. As you see in the terminal, the message inside class B is printed. But why? As you see, D does not have its own init method. When creating object from class D, Python goes to the parents classes. It goes over the parent classes one by one from left to right. Here, the first parent class is B. So Python executes the init methods of the B class and it prints inside class B message in the terminal. And if I change the order of parent classes here, can you guess the output? Let's see the result. This time, because the left parent class is C, the init method of the class C will be executed when an object is created from the D class. You can see inside class C message in the terminal. Now let me change the scenario. First, let me change the order of classes here. And I also remove the init method for class B and I just say pass. Now 
let's run the code and see the output in this case when creating d1 python goes to the d class the init method is not defined for d so it goes to b class as the left parent class but the b class does not have its init method now there is two options we can go to the parent of b which is a or we can go to the next parent of d which is c and in python because the searching for a method is based on the burst first search it goes to the next parent of d which is c the c class has its own init method so python execute the init method for c and as you can see in the terminal the inside class c message is printed the searching for a method in python is called mro which is abbreviated for method resolution order in this video you learned what happens when a class is inherited from multiple classes and in the next video i will show you how python access attributes when one class has multiple parents Simon says subscribe and click on the bell icon to receive notifications. In the last video, you saw how Python calls the method for a class that is inherited from multiple classes. In this video, I want to talk about the same process but about accessing attributes. For example, suppose we have three classes, A, B, and C, and C inherits from A and B. As you see, the X attribute is defined in both A and B class, so it is inherited by C as well. But the question here is what the value of X is for the C object. In this video, I will show you how attributes are accessed in multi-inheritance. The process is the same, so this is a short video to just show you what happens in this situation. So let's get started and jump into code. First, let me create a class named A and define the init method for this class. Now let's define X as an attribute and set it to 10. Also, I create a class named B that inherits from A. So in the init method, it calls the init method of the superclass. And it has attribute named Y that is set to 20. And the third class is C that inherits from A. So again, it should call the init method of the superclass also, I define y as attribute and set it to 40. And finally, I define a class named d that inherits from b and c, and inside its init method, it calls the init method of the superclasses. Okay, now let's define d1 as an object of d class. Because d1 is from d class that inherits from b and c, it inherits y attribute from b and c. Also, because b and c inherits from a, they have attribute x that is inherited by d as well. So here, let me print each of these attributes for d1 and see what is the value of each attribute. As you see, y is 20. Here, Python searches for y inside the d, and because y is not defined in d, it goes to the first parent class, which is b. y is defined in b, and its value is 20. So 20 is printed in the terminal and the value for x is 10. When we access x of d1, Python looks for x inside the d class, and x is not defined inside d, so Python looks for x inside the parent classes from left to right. Python goes to b, and it cannot find x inside b. Then it goes to c to see if it is defined for c, and it can't find it inside c. Now Python goes back to b as the first parent, and then search for x inside the parents of b, which is a. And finally, Python finds x here, and it prints the value of x, which is 10. Now let's make some changes in the definition of these classes. Here in the b class, I rename the attribute y to w, and print the value of the w here. Now what are the expected values of x, y, and w if I run the code? Let's see the result. This time when accessing d1.x, again x is inherited from a class, so it is 10. For the y attribute, because it's not defined for the d class, Python looks for y in the parents of d class. y is not defined in b, so it goes to c, and inside c finds the y attribute that is set to 40, so 40 is printed here. And for w again, it inherits from b, and 20 is printed here. 
as you see when an attribute is not defined in a class Python looks for the attribute in its parent classes from left to right and if the attribute is not defined in parent classes Python goes to parents of parents class Comparing to the last video, we can see that the process of accessing methods and attributes are the same. In this video and the previous video, you learned how Python manage accessing to attributes and methods when one class is inherited from multiple classes. In the next video, you will see a new concept called abstract class, which is useful functionality in object-oriented programming in Python. Hi, in the previous videos of this chapter, you learned the concept of inheritance. In inheritance, we have a parent class that all child classes inherit attributes and methods from this parent class. Sometimes there is a method which is shared by all child classes, but each child class has its own implementation for this method. For example, here we have three shapes, including rectangle, circle, and a square you decide to define a parent class which is the shape also suppose you would like to have a method named area which calculates the area for each shape in one hand because this method is a shared method it should be defined inside the shape class which is the parent class but on the other hand because each child class has a different formula for computing the area each child class should have its own implementation for this method in this situation, we have two solutions which I'm gonna show you in this video. The first solution is raising not implemented error and the second one is using abstract classes and methods. Now let's jump into code and see it in action. Suppose that we want to define two classes representing rectangle and circle. Because these two classes have some shared attributes and methods, I decide to define a superclass named shape. Here I define the shape class and the init method of this class takes self and color as parameters and set self.color to color. Also suppose that child classes must have an important method named area which calculates the area of the shape. Because all subclasses should have this method, this is a shared method. So I define this method in the parent class. So here I say def area and I pass self as the parameter and because the implementation of this method is different for different child classes I mean the formula for calculating area is different for a circle and rectangle I have to enter pass here and let the child classes to define their own implementation of this method also I define another method that returns the color of the shape here I define get color method that takes self as the only parameter and return the self.color as output. In this class, we define the two methods. The area method is a shared attribute, but it should be implemented by the child class. But the getColor method is a method that its behavior is fixed and is the same for all classes. So the implementation of this method goes to the parent class. Okay, now let's define two child class. The first child class is circle. It inherits from the shape class and the init method of the circle class takes self, color, and radius as parameter. And inside this method, first I call the super that dunder init dunder method. And here, because the init method of the super class needs a color, I pass the color to this method. And then I set self that radius to radius. Also, let me create another child class named rectangle that inherits from the shape class. The init method of this class takes four parameters, self, width, height, and color. Inside the init method, first it calls the init method of the super class and it pass color to this method. And then it sets self.width to width and self.height to height. At this point, although we haven't defined area method for the child classes, we are able to create a circle and rectangle object and use them. For example, here I define C1 of the circle class and as the parameter hint window shows, I need to pass color and radius to create a circle. Here I pass red and 10. 
Also, I define R1 equals rectangle, and then I have to pass width, height, and color. And I enter 2, 3, and blue. And now let's investigate the behavior of these two objects. Here, if I type C1 and then type dot, you can see a list of attributes and methods for the circle object. It has two attributes, color and radius, and two methods, get color and area. As I said, although we haven't yet defined the area method for the circle and rectangle class, here we can call this method for C1 and R1. Here I print area and C1.area, and also let me print area and R1.area. And now I run the code to see what happens. As you see, the code runs without any error, but the result is none because we haven't defined area method for the circle and rectangle classes. The problem here is that we want to force the child class to implement the area method for itself. In other words, I'm searching for a way to prevent the user from calling area method when it's not defined. So how can we fix this issue? There are two solutions for fixing this issue. The first solution is to raise an error when the area method is not implemented by the child class. Here, in the parent class, inside the area method, I raise not implemented error. And to make the error message more clear, here I pass a message like this. Area method is not implemented for self.dunder class dunder dot dunder name dunder. And now let's run the code and see the result. This time, as you can see, the program execution stopped with an error and the error says area method is not implemented for circle class. Also, if I go to the code and comment the line 26 and run the code again, you can see that the error message has changed. This time, the error message says area method is not defined for rectangle. As you can see in our first solution, the circle and rectangle class can be instantiated, but the created object cannot call the area method. Now let me show you the second solution we can force any classes that want to inherit the shape class to implement the area method before instantiating. The other solution is defining abstract classes and abstract methods. In object-oriented programming, an abstract method is a method without any implementation. Here, in our example, the area method in the shape class can be considered as an abstract method. When a class contains one or more abstract methods, then it is called an abstract class. Now let me show you how to define an abstract class and abstract method. Unlike other programming languages like Java, Python by default does not provide abstract methods or abstract classes, but it does offer a module called ABC that allows us to define abstract classes and methods. So first of all, we have to import ABC in our code. We usually import ABC like this. From ABC, import ABC, all capitals, and abstract method. ABC with capital letters is the abstract base class that all abstract classes should inherit from this base class. So here our shape class should be derived from ABC. Then to define a method as an abstract method, we have to use the abstract method decorator. For example, here to define the area method as abstract method, in the previous line I add add sign abstract method. That's it. Now we no longer need this raise statement. So again, I comment this statement and say pass. Now let me run the code and see what happens. Now let me uncomment this line and run the code to see what happens. As you see this time, I got an error that says cannot instantiate abstract class circle with abstract method area. It means we cannot even create a circle object without defining area method for the circle class. We have to force to define the area method for the circle class to be able to use it. So let's go to the circle class and overwrite the area method for this class. Here I say def area and I pass self. 
and inside this method it should compute and return the area of the circle to calculate the area we need pi so we have to import mass library here at the beginning of our code i import mass and now in the area method i return mass.pi times solve dot radius to the power of 2 now let me run the code this time the error is related to the rectangle class it says cannot instantiate abstract class rectangle with abstract method area so we have to implement area method for rectangle class 2 here inside the rectangle class I define the area method again and it returns self.width times self.height and now we can run the code as you see everything works well and the area for the circle and rectangle are printed here as conclusion when you want subclasses to have their own implementation of a shared method we have to define that method as abstract method in the parent class and therefore in this case we have to declare the parent class as abstract class in this video which was the last video of chapter 2 you learned the concept of inheritance and abstract classes in python if you're not a subscriber Click down below to subscribe so you get notified about similar videos we upload. To get the files the instructor used in this tutorial and follow along, click over there. And click over there to watch more videos on YouTube from Simon Says It.